Hi, welcome back. So all that work that you've been doing, learning to solve algebraic equations, has been bringing us to this point today. Every formula has multiple versions. And the last thing we want to have to do is remember several versions of the same formula. Instead, one version of the formula is enough, plus a little algebra to get us where we want to go. Or if a formula isn't available, a solid understanding of the situation, plus a little algebra, can get us where we need to go. And here, let me show you what I mean. So get your guided student notes out, and let's begin. You already know that absolute pressure is equal to the gauge pressure plus 14.7, because of course this 14.7 right here represents atmospheric pressure. So the absolute pressure is 14.7 pounds per square inch greater than the gauge pressure. And of course, we could restate this. We could talk about the gauge pressure. as being 14.7 pounds per square inch less than the absolute pressure. There we go. Two ways to state the exact same relationship. Do we need to memorize both of them? Well, I guess it depends on how often you use one version of the formula or the other. If you use them both a lot, then it's probably worth your time to memorize them both. If you don't use them both a lot, then let's memorize the one that you use a lot. And then we use some algebra, right? You can probably see this right here. If we subtract 14.7 on this side, gauge pressure is all by itself. Subtracting 14.7 on one side means we have to do it to the other. So this becomes absolute pressure minus 14.7. A little bit of algebra gets us where we want to go. Algebra is such a powerful tool. It can save us a lot of work. All right, so let's try to combine what we did in the last lesson with a little bit of new stuff and see where we can go. You might remember this one from the last lesson. The volume of a kitchen is 100 cubic feet less than four times the volume of the laundry room. And the first thing we want to do is start with some variables. So K will be the volume of the kitchen. And we'll let L be the volume of the laundry room. Oftentimes, we can find an equation just by working directly with what's been stated. The volume of the kitchen, that's got a letter, we call it K. Is represents equals. 100 cubic feet less than, we know that me that means we have to subtract 100 from something. What we're subtracting it from is four times the volume of the laundry room. That would be four times L, which is the volume of the laundry room. And there we go, we have an equation. We couldn't solve it yet because we don't know anything about the volume of either space. But if we knew that, like if we knew that the volume of the kitchen was 1,916 cubic feet, we could figure out the volume of the laundry room. Okay, so let's rewrite this equation here first. K equals 4L minus 100. And we fill in what we know. This K is 1,916. This is just some algebra now. We know what to do with this. The first thing we want to do in order to get this L all by itself is add 100 to both sides of the equation. Nothing new here. Big fat zero. 4L is all by itself. And on the left hand side, we have 2016. To undo the multiplication, we divide 4L by 4. And of course, what we do to one side, we do to the other. Right? 
4 divided by 4 is 1. L is left all by itself. 2016 divided by 4. Can you do that in your head? Probably. 4 goes into 25 times. 4 goes into 1 0 times. 4 goes into the 16 4 times. But, you know, if not, we can certainly use the calculator. Practice. Keep those mental skills sharp. There we go. 504. 504 what? The volume of the laundry room is 504. And these, of course, are cubic feet. Because those are the units that we were talking about in the original description. All right, let's try another. Let's repair a refrigerator. The refrigerator needs a new compressor. And the compressor costs $235.75. And of course, it needs some refrigerant. It has to be charged. The cost for the refrigerant is $2.10 per pound. So just the cost for materials on the bill is $239.32. And the question is, how much refrigerant did we use? A valid question. All right, let's see what we can do. Let's start with a word equation, right? The cost of the compressor. plus the cost of the refrigerant will give us that total cost. The cost of the compressor, we already know that. That's $235.75. The cost of the refrigerant, well, it's $2.10, but that's per pound. So we have to take that value and multiply by the number of pounds. And of course, that gives us our total of Rather than writing pounds of refrigerant all the time, let's use a variable, and perhaps we call that x. So 2.10x plus that 235.75 gives us 239.32. Ah, there we go, a lovely algebraic equation, which we know how to solve. In order to get x by itself, we first have to subtract off the constant, right? Constants on one side, variables on the other. So if we subtract $235.75 from the left side, we shall subtract it from the right-hand side. Of course, the whole point of doing that was to make the constants on the left-hand side go away, so we have that big fat zero. The 2.10x is left all by itself. And on the right-hand side, we have $239.72 minus the $235. Oops, that's not right. Try again. $239.32 minus the $235 and 75 cents. There we go, $3.57. How do we get x by itself from here? Right, of course, we divide. Divide both sides by the 2.10 and see what we have. Right on the left-hand side, 2.10 divided by 2.10 is 1 and leaves x all by itself. The other side, we have 3.57 divided by 2.10, and we have 1.7. And by now, we've forgotten what we were doing. 1.7 what? So we come back up and realize that this x was standing for pounds of refrigerant. So 1.7 
pounds of refrigerant were used. Where else might you need an algebraic equation? Well, we deal with a lot of tubes and pipes, and for that matter, even ducts. Ductus, right, with a T at the end of it, not the ones that quack. Um, anyway, the tubes, the pipes, the ducts, they all have a thickness so that the distance from outside edge to outside edge is not the same as the distance from inside edge to inside edge. On a circle, we call this outer diameter and inner diameter. So the outer diameter goes from the far left through the center all the way over to the far right on the outside of the pipe or the tube. The inner diameter is here. I'm going to take that away in a second because I don't want to confuse your notes. But as we bring this down, right, the inner diameter is this orange piece. And we could slide it right up and it would be on the inside of the tube. Okay, so let's erase that because we don't want that in your notes. And then we have some wall thickness. So if we were looking just at the diagram, to go from far left edge to far right edge, we'd have to start, go through one wall thickness, go through the inner diameter, and then go through another wall thickness. So the outer diameter is equal to the inner diameter plus two of those wall thicknesses. Or we could always say, hey, if I want to find the inner diameter, what I would do is start with the outer diameter and then subtract off two of those wall thicknesses, and I would be left with the distance from edge to edge on the inside of the pipe or the tube. Okay. Well, what if we needed to worry about the wall thickness? So here we go. The outer diameter of a tube is 0 0.035 inches. The inner diameter is 0 0.0313 inches. And we need to find the thickness of the tube. What should we do? Well, I don't know. We didn't write an equation back there for the wall thickness. We had a way to think about the outer diameter, and we had a way to think about the inner diameter. But we didn't have a way that said the wall thickness is equal to some formula. But that's OK. We don't need it. We have algebra. Start with, start with whichever formula you like. I like the one about the outer diameter. It's just a little visually nicer for me because I can mentally or visually add. Right? I will take the outer diameter and know that that is formed by taking the inner diameter plus two of those wall thicknesses. OK, so from here, let's just fill in what we know. The outer diameter is 0 0.035. The inner diameter is 0 0.0313. And of course, the wall thickness, we don't know, but there are two of them. And just filling in the values that we know gives us an algebraic equation. And you should be feeling pretty confident about your ability to solve this. So pause the recording here, solve this on your own, see what you get, and then come back. Okay, let's see how you did. In order to get W all by itself, the first thing that we need to do is subtract this 0 0.0313 from both sides of the equation. Big fat zero here. On the right hand side, 2W is left all by itself. On the left hand side, let's see, 0 0.035 minus 0. Point, whoops, back up there, 0 0.0313. And our final answer there is 0. 0.00. Thirty-seven, thirty-seven ten thousandths is the difference between the inner diameter and the outer diameter. Now, of course, it takes two wall thicknesses to create that difference. So we divide both sides of this equation by two. Certainly, two divided by two is equal to one, and that leaves W all by itself. And we will divide that last answer by two to find out that the wall thickness 
is 0 0.00185. Tenths, hundredths, thousandths, ten thousandths, hundred thousandths. 185 hundred thousandths of an inch thick. Don't forget your units. Okay, let's try another. Here we have a picture of a wall and a window. Definitely not to scale, but you know, that's okay. We can deal with that. This wall is 18.4 feet long. So let's label that 7.3 feet tall. The window is 5.4 feet wide, but we don't know the height. If we were going to insulate this wall, we would insulate, of course, the wall part and not the window part, and we would do something separate for the window portion. Right now, our job is to find out how tall the window is if we just have these dimensions. So let's see. We have the area of the wall, not including the window. That would be our shaded area. So this shaded area is the difference between the outer rectangle and the inner rectangle. And we know that the area of a rectangle is given by base times the height, or length times width, whichever you prefer. All right, so here we go. Shaded area. That would be the wall, not including the window, is 119.2 square feet, equal to the outer rectangle, which we have a base of 18.4 and a height of 17, uh, sorry, 7.3. So we can just multiply those. And the inner rectangle, that's our window. Whoops, not equals. We're going to subtract off the area of the inner rectangle. So we'll take the base, which is 5.4, and multiply by that height, which we don't know. All right, let's see what we can do. 119.2 is equal to, let's see, 18.4 multiplied by 7.3 gives us 134.32 minus that 5.4h. And now we're back to a place where you could solve this equation. Pause your recording and come back when you're ready. Okay, let's see how you did. In order to isolate H, the first thing we have to do is move this constant, the 134.32, away from the right-hand side. And of course, we'll do that by subtracting. Subtract that amount from both sides. Keep the equals where it came from. And let's see, 119. 0.2, oops, too many decimal points, back up a second, there we go, minus 134.32. And this is a negative answer. Don't panic just yet. Let's just see how it all works out. We have minus 15.12. A big fat zero here, but the minus sign in front of the 5.4 has to come down. Right, so keep track of that negative sign. And now when we look at this, even though these negatives may seem a little misplaced, they're actually just fine. This height should be a positive number, 
a positive times a negative will give us a negative number. So this should all work out when we get done. How do we get the h by itself? Well, we divide by that coefficient. Divide by negative 5.4. And of course, what we do to one side, we have to do to the other. 5.4 divided by 5.4 gives us 1. h is all by itself. And on the calculator, negative 15.12 divided by negative 5.4 gives us a positive 2.8. So trust in the algebra, trust in your assessment of the situation, and then when you get done, always go back and check and make sure that your answer is sensible. Right? A negative height wouldn't make any sense, but this 2.8 for a height is fairly reasonable. So now we come down and find out that the window is 2.8. Check our units back up where the problem was, 2.8 feet tall. And of course, we can always check that if we took the area of the wall, 7.3 times 18.4, and subtracted off the area of the window, 5.4 times 2.8, that we end up with the area of the wall that doesn't include the window, 119.2 square feet that they told us about to begin with. Okay, let's try a little bit more. Flip the page. We have the last two problems. The first one talks about perimeter. The perimeter of a rectangle is 20.8 inches. The length is 4.3 inches longer than the width. And we're looking for the dimensions of the rectangle. This example gives us two equations. We have a mini equation and we have a main equation. The mini equation is the one that says the length of the rectangle is 4.3 inches longer, so we know we have to add 4.3, longer than the width. And the second one is the one that we use to talk about perimeter of a rectangle. So the perimeter, we already know, is two lengths plus two widths. And what we do is drop the mini equation into the main equation. So like this. The perimeter we have a value for. That's 20.8. Right, we'll fill in everything that we know. Equals 2 times the L. And I don't know the value for L, but I know something about the L. So I take the L out and put in, I'll do it in red so you can see it, W plus 4.3. Let me clean that up a second. There, that's better. So W plus 4.3 went in for the L. And then, of course, we add the two W's. Okay. When we look at this, when you took the L out, we had to leave that big gaping hole behind with parentheses and put in the W plus 4.3. And that, of course, means that we need to use that distributive property. 2 times w and 2 times 4.3. So here's what we have. 20.8. 2 times w is 2w. Two, 2 times 4.3 is 8.6. And then don't forget about the remaining 2w's there. We have some like terms that we can combine on the right hand side. 2w's plus 2w's will give us 4w's. And of course the 8.6 is still being added. Okay, take it from here. You know how to solve this. Come back when you're done. Let's see how you did. So our first step is to subtract 8.6 from both sides of the equation. Big fat zero here on the right hand side. Leaves 4w all by itself. On the left hand side 20.8 minus 8.6 gives us 12.2. The right hand side says 4 times w, so we'll divide both sides by 4. And that leaves us with w all by itself because 4 divided by 4 is 1. 
on the left hand side, 12.2 divided by 4 is equal to 3.05. All right, what is that? 3.05 what? Well, that's the width of the rectangle, and these are in inches. But they didn't ask us for the width, they asked us for the dimensions. And dimensions need, mean that we need both the length and the width. So the width is 3.05 inches. The length is, well, what do we know? Take this 3.05 inches and bring it right back up here. 3.05 plus 4.3 should give us 7.35. And we use our calculator to check that 2 times 7.35 plus 2 times the width, which is 3.05, really gives us the perimeter that they said we had, which it does. Okay, last one. Working overtime. Moline earns $22.75 an hour during the regular 40-hour work week and $35.50 an hour for every hour of overtime worked. Last week's paycheck was $1,328.90. I think Moline worked a lot. Um, if we were to check to decide whether or not she was even going to be working some overtime, we would take the $22.75 and multiply by 40. So if she just worked a regular work week, the earnings would be $910. And she earned way more than that. So we definitely have some overtime. So let's see what we can do. This time, let's start by writing a word equation and defining some variables. The question is, how many hours did Moline work? So let's just use that for our variable. All right, and let's see, the total pay is going to come from the pay for the regular hours, and we figure that out by taking the regular hours times the pay rate. So we'll take the regular hours times the pay rate. Plus, and now we need some overtime hours. And we earn $35.50, so we have the pay rate, times the number of overtime hours. Okay. Overtime hours is not H. H would be total hours. So we need to figure out the overtime hours. And those are anything above 40, right? If she worked for 42 hours, the number of overtime hours would be 2. We'd take 42, subtract off 40, and end up with 2. So we take the number of hours worked and subtract off 40 to find the number of overtime hours. OK, so let's fill in what we know. Total pay, $1,328.90. Is equal to, well, we have 40 regular hours times $22.75 an hour, plus $35.50 an hour, multiplied by that H minus 40. That's our overtime hours. We can clean this up a little bit. $1,328.90 is equal to, well, 40 times 22.75, we already calculated as being 910. But over here, we have to do a little distributing. Right, one here and one there. Multiply the $35.50 by H and by the negative 40. So $35.50 times H. Don't forget the subtraction sign for the next piece. $35.50 times 40. 
gives us 1,420. Okay, can we clean up the right-hand side? Um, yeah, we can do that. We've got some constants we can combine. 910 minus 1,420 gives us negative 510. 1,328.9 equals 35.50 times h minus 510. Okay, don't let this subtraction bother you. Trust in your algebra. Trust in our assessment of the situation. See how it all works out. Check our answer, and then we'll be able to tell if we've made a mistake somewhere or not. But here, what you're looking at, again, you know how to solve this equation. Pause the recording. Come back when you're done, and we'll check and see how you did. All right, let's see how things are working. The very first step is to add 510 to both sides of the equation. Big fat zero here. Leaves us with 35.5h on the right hand side and 1,838 Point nine on the left hand side. To undo the multiplication we need to use a division. So we'll divide both sides of the equation by 35.5. Certainly on the right hand side 35.5 divided by itself is 1 and that leaves h all alone. And on the left hand side 1,838 9 divided by 35.5 is 51.8. What is this 51.8? Um, come back to where we defined our variables. Really important here. 51.8 is the number of hours worked. So this is not a number of overtime hours. Moline worked for 40 regular hours and if we subtract 40 from 51.8 that would be 11.8 overtime hours. So this 51.8 is total hours just like we defined our variables. And if we wanted to double check our math here, we could say, all right, 40 multiplied by $22.75 an hour plus 11.8 overtime hours at the $35.50 an hour rate. And there we are, $1,328.90 for the week's paycheck. Okay, so we'll be talking to you later. Good luck on your homework. Take care. Bye-bye.